Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast. Each week, your host, Casey Haston, Director of Recruiting at VIP, will bring you valuable insights from thought leaders, introduce you to incredible companies, and bring you tips for landing your dream job from our team of executive recruiters at VIP. And now, Casey Haston. Welcome to the We Are VIP podcast, a podcast devoted to adding value to your career or candidate search, brought to you by VIP. I'm your host, Casey Haston. I'm an executive recruiter, director of recruiting with VIP, and your all-around hiring guru. And today, as usual, I would love to introduce you to our new guest that we have with us today. Um, I originally met her at a conference and was just amazed at all the knowledge bombs she was dropping um, while we were sitting at the table. So today on the show, I'd like to welcome Tannis Cornell, CEO of EWF International, a leadership accelerator for women leaders throughout their career life cycle. Tannis possesses a broad background in senior leadership positions ranging from Fortune 500 to startup environments, and she has led organizations in rapidly growing their business and developing the organizational structure needed to succeed. She is passionate about helping women leaders grow their business, increase their effectiveness, gain access to the skills and knowledge needed to excel, and meet their personal and professional goals. Tannis, thank you for saying yes to coming on this podcast. Thank you for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here. I am not even kidding that when I had, when I was sitting at the table with you, I was in a conversation with another lady, you started talking, and I just went, what? I need to be <laughs> part of your conversation. <laughs> it was so good, and you just have so much information, oh. and, and you're so willing to share it with other women and with other people, not just women. I'm, you know, I know you right. help others we as do. well. We so. Do. Yeah. so tell me a little bit about EWF, and what does it feel like to be helping and enriching these women's careers? Well, I'll tell you, my job doesn't feel like a job. I love uh, that. You know, I, I enjoy my work every single day. And I've been working with EWF for seven years. And then a business partner and I acquired the company two years ago. And so we now lead the company. Nice. And uh, it's really it's really been a blast. And so to give you a little bit of background on EWF, you know, our mission is to accelerate gender parity uh, within companies and help women business owners scale their business. Nice. And we do this not just because it's the right thing, which it is, mm-hmm. but we really do it because it's a business imperative. What we know from all of the data out there is that companies that have a greater level of gender parity in their management ranks and in their executive ranks outperform their competitors financially. Gotcha. And so there's a real business driver for companies to pay attention Uh, to why women are good for their business. And so our passion is really about equipping women uh, to be able to fill the pipeline Mm -hmm. and take on greater and greater uh, levels of responsibility and greater levels of leadership because we know that's good for companies. We embrace and love our male colleagues, but Mm -hmm. we also know that we as women have a lot to offer companies. Yes. And when they embrace us, we all perform better. And so that is the point of what we're all about. I love that. And so last year... I think y'all had a big celebration, right, for 20th, your 20th? We had our 20th 20-year uh, celebra- celebration. Awesome. So a lot of companies never make it past five years. So we've been here for more than 20, uh, serving literally hundreds of women yeah. and companies uh, with programs uh, for women throughout their career life cycle, and then doing a lot of internal programs for companies as well that often include our male colleagues as well. So while our specialty and our niche <laughs> is uh, women's leadership programs and our public programs are for women. Uh, we do a lot of internal work with companies as well okay. uh, where we embrace our male colleagues Got as it. well. Got it. So in, you said you've been with the company for seven years. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, take us back to what it looked like in the beginning sure, and what it looks like now that it has new boss ladies in charge. Okay. You know, the company was originally founded out of Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, uh, by two women who had both been in corporate America, they had been in nonprofits, they had worked with business owners, and at that time, over 20 years ago, really the only, there were only a couple of major uh, CEO peer forum groups, Mm -hmm. and the revenue requirement to participate for the most part excluded most women owned businesses. Oh, wow. Um, Most, they were either at five million or ten million dollars in revenue, and a lot of times women owned businesses 
didn't drive that kind of revenue because they tended to be professional services kinds of businesses. They weren't manufacturing widgets, as an example. Gotcha. And they felt like there was a really underserved market for women business owners that could really use these peer advisory forums and having a peer advisory board of other accomplished female professionals and business owners to really help them think through strategic issues that they were facing for their company. So they launched the company mm -hmm. doing peer boards, peer advisory boards for women business owners. I met the CEO about five years into it and I was talking with her, and at the time I was an executive in a okay. Fortune 1000 telecom company, had an officer level position there, and I said, you know, I think you're missing a whole market of executive women who would value that same opportunity to sit among peers that are outside their workplace environment and have a safe, confidential place where they could talk about the issues that they are addressing in their business. And, you know, a lot of times, there are women face things, and not just women, men do too, mm -hmm. but women face a situation, they're in a leadership position, and they're now out of their comfort zone with something, or they're facing a decision that they don't want to necessarily expose their uncertainty uh, within the company because that's politically dangerous. Right. And to have a safe place with other accomplished peers that they could sit down and talk that through with them and say, what are my blind spots? What am I missing? Am I thinking about this correctly? Right. And so they started peer groups for executives at that point. And then when I started with the company about seven years ago, I was had the Dallas market and I built a peer forum for business owners and one for executives. And I had many of those executives and owners come to me and say, what do you guys have for women who are in earlier stages of their career? And I would have to say, well, you know, that's not the market we serve. You know, we're really about senior leaders. And they would go, yeah, but we need that. We need that. So I felt that the universe was speaking to me. Mm -hmm. So I launched a pilot program in Dallas to launch our Emerging Leader Program, which is a curriculum-based program for women who are in earlier stages of their yeah. career. They haven't yet reached the senior ranks. And that program, we're now in our fifth year of that program. It's gone really well. It tends to expand every year. And as a result of the people coming out of that <laughs> program, we're going to be launching new programs that are really focused on kind of that mid-level executive. Mm -hmm. Haven't reached the senior ranks, but they're beyond the entry-level ranks. Right. And we're putting uh, an intensive program together we're calling Catalyst that we'll probably launch late this year or early next year. Okay. Um, that will really prepare those women to reach the senior ranks. So, well, that kind of answers my next question. What's uh -huh. in store for EWF that's, in the that's, future? That's what we're really working on in the future for okay. those programs. Uh, one of the things that has really developed over time, we, at one time we're really focused on our public programs, mm -hmm. but as a result of those programs, we begin to get asked a lot to come speak at various events. Uh, about gender parity, about career okay. issues for women. And then we got started getting asked to come in and do workshops or professional development days mm -hmm. or help them design a program. And so a lot of our work now is working with companies. Um, sometimes it's to design a program for them, but oftentimes it's to supplement things that they're already doing. Gotcha. And frequently we're working with companies in their uh, employee resource groups. They may have an employer, an ERG group for women and they want to offer them meaty content, uh, help them figure out their career paths, and so we go in and work with them and deliver uh, programs for their ERG group. So I would love to know who these companies are that are so forward-thinking that they are coming to you to develop their women leaders. Well, there's a lot of them out there, yeah. and many, many companies out there have ERG groups. Coming out of technology, kind of the first company that asked me to come in and speak was Fujitsu because Fujitsu is in a, you know, they're in telecom, mm -hmm. um, they're a Japanese owned company, which even that culture uh, and that culture for women is sometimes challenging. Right. And so they started uh, an internal women's group, they call it women, uh, WIN, Women's Something Network. And I'm blank on what the WIN stands for, but they <laughs> called okay. it WIN. But they wanted to offer their women leaders opportunities to grow and advance and also have the opportunity to interface with the senior executives in the company. Huh. So it's not just for the women, um, but a lot of their male colleagues also participate. Because fortunately for us, there are a lot of men out there that really see the value mm -hmm. of advancing women leaders in their organization and they want to support those efforts. And so it's not we're not special because we're women, but women do sometimes face uh, unique challenges mm -hmm. uh, in ways that our male colleagues do not. 
you know, as an example, women tend to be judged more harshly on our leadership risk behaviors. You know, I, I can say something and a male colleague can say the exact same thing, but how it's perceived when I as a female say it versus how it's perceived when a male says it is oftentimes different. And so, I mean, we see that in our political environment. I mean, we all see it every day and we recognize that's true. So it's a challenge sometimes for women to figure out how they navigate those scenarios. So we talk about that a lot. And, uh, and you teach them how to do that, and right? We, talk, we teach them and talk to them about navigating. Uh, when we have our male colleagues inv involved, we create dialogue mm -hmm. that helps to illuminate some of those underlying assumptions, yeah. unconscious biases. And believe Ooh, me, that's a big one. it's not just men that have unconscious bias about women. Women have unconscious bias about women. Could you give us an example of one you of those know, for each? Well, as women, we have this expectation of what we think of how a woman should behave. And so both men and women can sometimes judge a woman pretty harshly, harshly if she's, they think she's aggressive. They okay. can see that behavior in her, and she would be judged differently than her male colleague because it's kind of expected out of a male leader. Right. And so a lot of it is about us being aware of ourselves and how we can support each other and all grow together as professionals. That's a lot of what, a lot of what we're about. Okay. I know another topic that y'all really focus on is building confidence. And, mm -hmm. you know, something that you talked about with uh, my team when you yeah. did the Lunch and Learn there, we really appreciated that um, and the art of navigating those crucial conversations right with that confidence, right? So can you help us define crucial conversations and relate it to our audience who may be looking for a job or negotiating a salary sure. increase? And you know, crucial conversations was kind of coined from the book, mm -hmm. but it, it, it's, you can call it a critical conversation. Uh, you can call it a difficult conversation. So there's a lot of words. Right, anything that... But crucial conversations are really when the stakes are high. Yep. A uh, strong emotion is often involved, and differing opinions are often involved. Yes. And that's often what makes a, a conversation crucial. If you agree on everything, and it's easy, it's not necessarily crucial. Or critical. A, a, a crucial conversation is when conflict uh, is often a part mm -hmm. of that conversation. And one of the number one skills of top leaders is the ability to have those conversations and do them well. Do them authentically, have good outcomes, uh, don't leave people screaming and crying in the hallways, uh, but be able to engage in those dialogues and come to a joint resolution with people. Yes. And so, you know, it could be negotiating for a job offer, could be a crucial conversation with someone. Um, it really depends on the circumstance. If you're a leader and you have to address a performance mm -hmm. situation with one of your employees, that's a crucial conversation because it's high stakes yep. for the employee. You know there's going to be strong emotion involved. Yep. And frequently the viewpoint about that is different. And so that's a good example of a crucial conversation. But you also often have crucial conversations with your colleagues. You know, maybe you have a peer and your teams have to work together and that's not going well and you've got to have a crucial conversation about that. Maybe it's a customer conversation that you have to have. Oh, we have those all the time. <laughs> I, I've had to have those conversations. Let's say you've got a customer and they're not paying you mm -hmm. for your services. We all deserve to be paid for the value we're presenting. Absolutely. And so you may have to have that crucial conversation. But you don't want to leave that conversation with animosity, with anger. And so your ability to craft that conversation in a positive way is really important. And there are a number of books written on the subject. And we take from all that material. We also take from the material. We use a set of assessment tools from a company called Lumina Learning. They have a set of big five psychometric tools that go very deep into personality, emotional intelligence, leadership. And so we take a lot of that material and we create um, a lot of the workshops and mm -hmm. the programs around this particular subject. We pull from all of those materials uh, to help teach people how to have productive, crucial conversations. I think that is so interesting that you do that because as I've mentioned before, I'm an assessment junkie. Uh -huh. So I would love to get my hands on that one because it's not one that I've heard about before. Yeah. Um, and I like the fact that they're bringing in all those different pieces to it, especially like with the emotional intelligence. Because right. I think, I, I believe this is something that's been missed for so long. 
mm -hmm. in companies and not really addressing that and helping to groom your employees with that emotional intelligence. Right. So, Limited Learning, their assessment tools are fantastic. They're big five psychometric tools, meaning they come out of academia and they're based on all of the years of research mm -hmm. that's been done on personality. And big five is a psych uh, psychiatric and psychology term that you'll hear a lot. It's based on kind of what are the, the standards um, that are really out there as it applies to personality. They're commonly accepted okay. uh, things about personality. In fact, National Geographic had a whole issue devoted to big five really? uh, psychology. And so this is what is considered a big up. five tool, uh, meaning that the validation has been um, studied in great detail and so that we know that the results of those assessments are, are very, very accurate. And personality is personality across the world. Mm -hmm. And so it's about how you use the particular traits that are your preferences what happens when you're under stress? You may choose different characteristics Good point. when you are under stress. And so understanding what your over, we call them overextended behaviors in Lumina terms, understanding what those are and how they can get you into trouble in a work environment is really important. Being able to build a team around you, not everybody can be great at everything. Exactly. And so if you have great self-insight into your own strengths, but also into your own gap mm -hmm. areas, you can build a team around you that can cover your blind spots. Exactly. And that has, scallop, has talent. You know, I was never, I always said, if you had made me be a CPA, I'd have to shoot myself because I can't be that detail-oriented. But a lot of times, you, I need that detail orientation. So I would hire people on my team that were really great at that. Yeah. And they made me better because I recognized it was a gap that I had. And so they, can, they made me better. And so that's really the value of these. And we implement these tools in almost all of our programs, our public programs, mm -hmm. because they give people really deep self-insight and then help them work on not only their strengths and how to get better at what they're great at and identify their superpowers, we like to call them, what makes them unique and yes. what their gifts are, but also identify their danger zones. Because as much as we love our strengths and we know that building on our strengths is what typically gets us those opportunities to advance, mm -hmm. what trips us up in our career is those danger zones, those overextensions that we I haven't learned how to deal that. well with. I, I, we need to talk afterwards. No. I think I have a few danger zones we need we to all work do. on. We all do. <laughs> Unfortunately, nobody is exempt uh, from those danger zones. Well, and I think that kind of going back to the crucial conversations, and I'll just be honest, this is an area that I struggle with because I'm so passionate about everything yes. that I do. And if I'm mad at you, I'm probably pretty passionate about that right. too. And so I really have to step back and, you know, figure out what it is, why I'm having this conversation. Yes. And I know you talk about that. It's so important to find out why we're having this conversation and defining what you want ahead of time. So, you know, let's talk about that sure. and why it's so important to talk about the why first and to have that outline. Well, whether you're looking at the book, Crucial Conversations, or other models, what we want to do is give people a framework to think about how to have that conversation. Mm -hmm. And one of the things we talk about, and the book talks about, is starting with the heart, starting with your why. Um, if you're married um, or if you've been in a relationship, we all know those situations where we've fought over a situation mm -hmm. over and over again, and we fight about an issue, but it's really the underlying we're not really fighting about what it's really about, right? Right. I'm fighting because you left your towels on the floor, and the underlying issue is you aren't respecting all the work I go to to keep the house clean. Thank the, you. The, the same thing happens in business, that we often have a conflict over an issue, but it's not the real underlying reason. So when you have time to think about how you want to approach mm -hmm. a crucial conversation, there's real value in sitting there and doing some self-analysis and what is my why about having this conversation? What feelings is this generating in me? Uh, what frustration is this generating in me? And when we can authentically share that with someone that we're talking to, it helps us to reach what we call having a clue, a common level of understanding. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> that if I can share my why and then truly be opening to listening to the other person's why, that can help us create a solution. Uh, because we come from different perspectives. 
we all know the situation. We laughed. We had one of our emerging leader classes this morning, and we were talking about this particular subject, as a matter of fact. Really? So it was a good refresher for me for, for the podcast today. But, you know, you know, one of the things that we talked about, and I can tell you in my own career as a leader, you know, I've gone in to my team, and I've said, here's what I want to have happen, and I thought I was being really clear uh. in my communication. And off they went, and then they brought me something back, and I'm going, what? <laughs> I don't, that's, that's not what I intended. That's not what I had in mind. When those things happen, you have to look inside yourself. Exactly. What did I do to not be clear? Did I not validate that they understood? And so that really challenges yourself because you have to remember that people filter everything through their own frame of reference, mm -hmm. their own experiences, their own perceptions. And so it's why in police work, they talk about eyewitness testimony not being all that great because different people, they can see the same event happen. Exactly. And they remember different things. Mm -hmm. They perceive different things because they're filtering it through their own um, all of the life experiences they've yep, had. Yep. So we have to constantly remember that. And when you can start with your why about having that conversation, it helps to set the framework for the person you're engaged with. You know, you just reminded me of something that I read in Brene Brown's book, mm -hmm. Dare to Lead. Have you read yes, that one? I love, love Brene, Brene okay, Brown. Okay, what does she say? She says, paint it done, or uh, yeah. is that it? I don't remember the exact But you know phrase. what I'm talking yes. about where she says that's how they get to you know, they, she described the exact same scenario you're talking mm -hmm. about, and she's like, so now we say, you know, paint it done. And that may not be exactly right, so don't send me any <laughs> that's okay. emails about it. But, but I think that's so interesting that, you know, you're just emphasizing that again. Right. So, there are um, many people who've written about this subject. Oh, yeah. So Crucial Conversation is just one book. Exactly. Uh, but um, so, but it, it's a key skill um, for people who can help to resolve meaningful conflict. Because if you have an organization where there's never any conflict, that's typically command and control and people are afraid to speak up. Oh, I if like that. If there's never any conflict, something is wrong. Because nobody agrees all the time. That's and a really so good point. And so somebody is making all the decisions and they're failing to get perspective from people who may have a different viewpoint. And one of the things we talked about this morning, and uh, Jennifer Carter was leading our session, mm -hmm. she's our company president, was leading the session this morning, and she talked about her own experience of having crucial conversations, and that in almost every case she could think of, when you truly open yourself, because the next step is, one of the next steps is listening to the mm -hmm. other party as well, that if you truly are listening, you will almost always have a little different perception of that issue than you had when you walked into the conversation. And so sharing your why and then also understanding the other party's why mm -hmm. is a big thing before you could really have meaningful conversation about how do we solve this. So I have a question. If, let's say, I'm entering the conversation with you fully intending to have that crucial conversation mm -hmm. in the right manner. You enter the conversation you, mm -mm, you're not playing that game. You're just, no. you're there to say your piece, you know, and you're going to be right no matter what. How would one who's trying to do that crucial conversation the right way respond? A lot of it is setting up the conversation that, hey, I want to have this conversation. Um, if you spring it on someone, mm. a lot of times the first, when, when you articulate something, the first human response is to be defensive. Yes. So a lot of times it's, I say, if you've got that table conversation, instead of doing it right there, say, you know what, let's take time to really think about this and let's reconvene this afternoon and let's sit down and let's really have a conversation about this. Because if people have time to process and think about mm -hmm. what they want to say, then it's really helpful. So, you know, when you're going in for a, let's say that you're being called on the carpet for some performance review, if you have time to think about it and it's not sprung on you in advance, a lot of times you can be more emotionally ready mm -hmm. to yeah. handle the conversation. That's so a, really a lot good of point. times setting it up, and not every conversation you have can you prepare for in advance. Right. But when they're really critical and you have that opportunity to really sit down and plan the conversation, plan the points you want to make, think about your why. What is it that I want to achieve for me? out of this conversation, but also, what do I want for that other person? 
out of this conversation? And what do I want for that relationship? And so, and what do I not want to have happen? Right, good point. I, I want to talk to my boss about micromanaging me, but I don't want him to feel or her to feel offended. I don't want him or her to retaliate. And to be able to articulate that in the conversation when you are expressing your why helps them know what your intent is. It's really about intent. If your intent is from the heart and your intent is good and people understand that, they're more willing to have that conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. So the final step in the crucial conversation is to agree and commit to the resolution. How can someone hold themselves and the other person in the conversation accountable without being confrontational or accusatory like we just talked yeah. about? And I'm telling you, I'm the first to go there. Well, yes. and this is the step that's often missed. You go in and you have this great conversation. And, oh, we think we've solved the problem. And then there's no mutual decision that the problem is solved and what are we going to do next? And do we have a commitment mm -hmm. from both parties? And you have to get people to say it. Yeah. I commit to doing X. Once you have that commitment, then you can talk about, here's our appropriate checkpoints. Do we need to have a meeting once a week uh, to do this? Do we need to have a check-in once a month? What's the appropriate check-in so that we inspect what we expect? Ooh. See, this is the kind of stuff she was saying at the conference. <laughs> well, that, that phrase is not new with me, but it's but, one that I've heard that I always love. Say, say that again. Inspect what you expect. Okay. So if you leave that conversation and you never revisit it, then oftentimes it does leave opportunity for future conflict. And sometimes what you find is maybe there was not the shared level of understanding you thought there was. Yes. And you might have to revisit that. Maybe someone isn't upholding their end of the commitment, and you might have to revisit that. But when you both commit to the outcome you're going to achieve, um, and you talk about the checkpoints, and you've both committed to those checkpoints, mm -hmm. it's much more likely to happen. And so you do have to have a follow-up uh, beyond the conversation and get commitment at the end of that conversation that here's how we're going to move forward. I think I need to go th to another lunch and learn on crucial <laughs> conversations. <laughs> so. You know, as a leader for women and, you know, and a mentor and all that good stuff, I know you give lots of advice and lots of good advice to people. What is one piece of advice that you were given that changed your life or your career, whatever? I think I'll share a story that's a lesson. Okay. That was actually a gift. So he didn't tell me the advice. He made me experience the advice, Ooh. which was much more meaningful. Um, this was, I was a fairly young in my career. I was a sales manager with a technology company, mm -hmm. so I managed the sales team. And I had a counterpart, who was also female, incidentally, which in those days was fairly unusual, um, who ran operations. And we started experiencing some problems with installation, uh, with customer support in terms of responsiveness, a number of things. And so I'd gone to her uh, you know, several times and kind of said, you know, we're having these issues. We need to do something about these issues. And kind of this is your team's issue, and please take care of that. <laughs> and, and I had tremendous respect for her, and mm -hmm. we liked each other, and uh, we're good colleagues. But nothing was really happening, and I was getting frustrated. So I finally decided, okay, you know, I'm getting customer calls, getting customer complaints. I'm going to have to escalate this to our boss. So I went into him, and I kind of laid out what was happening and um, basically said, you know, this is happening. I need you to go fix this with her. And he turned back to me and said, huh. He goes, you need to figure out how to solve that. You know, you and she need to figure out how to solve that. And he kind of shooed me out. But I said, but, but, but I, I can't control that. That's not my role. It's not my responsibility. I don't have any control over her team. I, well, there's nothing I can do about it. And he goes, hmm. Yeah, you, you need to go figure that out. Wow. And I, I walked out of his office being really frustrated. But Not the outcome of your crucial conversation no. you wanted, right? <laughs> so I'm thinking, okay, he sent me off to fix it. He's not going to rescue me. So what am I going to do? So what I had to do was I, I thought, well, the conversations we've had so far haven't worked. So okay. I guess what that's going to require of me is a different approach. So without even realizing what I was doing, I created a different crucial conversation. And instead of going into her and saying, you know, your team is really screwing up. 
and here's an example, and here's an example, and here's an example. I went in going, you know, we've talked several times about this, and things just don't seem to be getting better. Help me understand what's happening. Can you tell me what's happening? Is there anything that my team might be able to do which would be helpful to your team? And so when I really opened up and came at it from that perspective, what can I do to help? Help me really understand your position and what struggles you're mm -hmm. having. That was a whole different conversation. That's awesome. Whole different conversation. And what I learned from that is that you can take responsibility even when you don't have authority. Ooh. And that you have to take responsibility about what you're doing to contribute mm -hmm. to the conversation. So while I didn't have authority over her team, I did have influence right. with her and by being open and having that conversation. And I told that boss, who was a mentor to me in many ways, I said, that was probably one of the most valuable career lessons you ever told me, was that I had the power to solve it myself, that I didn't need to be rescued, and that I also owned my own responsibility in resolving that situation. And so that was a great career lesson. So it was advice he gave me in the form of experience rather than just telling me. Oh, I think that yeah. is great. And I love your approach and the way you turned it around and helped me understand. And yeah. you had actually shared that story with us in the Lunch and Learn. Yes. And I <laughs> use that all the time now. Right. And I'm, especially if I'm having to do like a performance review or something like that. I'm like, help me understand why X right. happened. Well, it's the example that comes to mind in my own mm -hmm. career. When, and there are many other examples I could come up with, but that's the one that really resonates with me. Uh, and I remember it vividly. And it was the, and I realized that, oh, this is not just about her. You know, we could probably help um, in my team. Yeah. And it, it, it made for a whole different relationship. So, Tannis, um, how do people find you? How do they get in touch with you? Several ways. Um, you can, the easiest way to find us is on our website. Okay. www.ewf, -E which stands for Executive Women's Forums. So, EWF International, spelled out, dot com. That's easy. E and so we have, yeah, we have a con contact form on the website, and um, would be are getting ready to launch our next emerging leader program in April. That's so awesome. So if we have any up and coming women leaders that are listening to the podcast today, and you're interested in really jump starting your career, reaching the next level, we like to say that the people that we attract to our programs, our public programs, our, our women's programs, are they're women with a growth mindset. Love they it. want to grow, they want to do better in their job, they want to offer more to their company, and they always believe they can learn. And um, we have a fantastic, fantastic groups of women that come together in these programs and really learn from each other and build fantastic relationships with other people in the, in the class. I love that so much. Thank you so much. So we are down to the fun questions. Not that yours weren't fun, <laughs> okay. but these are a little off the wall. So it's our All VIP right. questions. Are you ready? I think so. Okay. So if you were chosen to be one of the first colonists on Mars, mm -hmm. what three things or people would you take with you? You made my head hurt when you sent me this question to think about. <laughs> I just went, gee, I thought, well, I'd take my Bible. That would probably be the first thing. Um, I would have to take my coffee because I just don't know that I can get through the day. Coffee's without important. Without some coffee, some coffee beans. That, and then I need to find a real-life version of the Ben Affleck character in The Martian because he figured out how to create uh, water. He create, figured out how to grow food. And so I need to find that savvy engineer to take with me so that we could survive. On there Mars. you go. That's important. <laughs> <laughs> and I could take Ben. Ben would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. Now I'm totally derailed. Um, what is one thing you do every morning to set your day up for success? You know, I, a practice for me is to really, if I take just five or ten minutes, and sometimes it's the night before, mm -hmm. uh, or it might be that morning, but just to really think about what are my three priorities for today? What are the, most, the three most important things to get accomplished today? Because our days overwhelm us, mm -hmm. we're getting phone calls, we're answering email, and it is so easy to get really busy and be really busy but not do the things that are really impactful. Yes. And so I always really try to remind myself and set aside time. These are the three things that I must 
accomplish yep. today. And if I get those three things done, I may get a lot of other stuff done too. But if I get nothing else done, at least I've gotten these three things done. So I wonder what the magic is about having three, because you read about that all the time. Yep. It, some people call them rocks. Some, yeah, the, the, uh, traction. Uh, yes, the, you know, the they US. talk about you know having your rocks, and I just say three because. My, I mean, my to-do list usually has about 20 items on right, it. Right, right. But if I just start going it down the to-do list from 1 to 20, I might not get the most important things done. So if I know I get the top three done for that day, then that, then that makes me feel good and that I've accomplished something. And, and I may get five done or I may get seven done. Right. I never get 20 done. <laughs> <laughs> so. I was just curious because it's like everybody I talk to that, you know, and I uh -huh. get a very, from successful people, you usually do get that answer, uh -huh. putting your day in order. And I'm just curious, everybody always says three. And I do three. Yeah. And I'm like, and but then I have a to-do list, but my top three are. Well, I think it has to do with focus. You can't really focus on more than about three things at a time. And it's why companies, even when companies do major initiatives for the year, mm -hmm. you can't really do much more than three. Okay. Because you can't focus on more. Now, there are a lot of other objectives and things that you have, and people will build ob objectives to help accomplish those three initiatives. But if you go, okay, team, we've got 1,000 employees, and we've got these 10 initiatives that everybody needs to do, mm. people, they can't do that. They can't focus on that. So yeah. three is an easy number to focus on. Got it. Thank and you. So I've been so curious that's, about that. <laughs> for me, it's about focus. All right. So my final question for you today. If your life's work was being summarized in a news article, what would the headline be? She learned that she could do it. Ooh, I like that one. And I just think that's, the, you know, so many experiences in my career were doing things I'd never done before. Okay. You know, I had opportunities to go in and create something from scratch or create a team from scratch or... I was with a, a company that at, during the time of deregulation, we were one of the first facilities-based companies that could offer alternate local phone service to the mm. telco. Well, nobody had ever done that before, so we had to put in all the processes, figure out how to work with the phone company. Very challenging. But, you know, those were the times I learned the most. And you would go in and, you know, you'd feel overwhelmed, like, oh, man, have I got myself into more than I can handle. Yeah. But I learned each and every time. I was a, I could figure it out. She could do it. And I, you know, I tell people that go through our programs the same thing. If you don't push yourself out of your comfort zone, you'll never know if you can do it. That's amazing. And what happens when we talked about confidence earlier, mm -hmm. it's just like raising your children. How do children learn confidence? They don't learn because you pat them on the shoulder all the time and tell them how wonderful they are. That's not what builds confidence. What builds confidence is when they learn how to do it themselves. True. You can give them guidance, but when they really internalize that confidence, it's when they've accomplished it themselves. And it's still true as adults. So what builds confidence is actually going out and doing it. Now, does that mean I've, been, I've never had a failure? Oh, no. No, you've got to fail forward, uh, right? Yes. So. But I love what Arianna Huffington says. She says, failure is the stepping stone to success. Yes. We always, those, what you have to do is rebound and be resilient from those failures, figure out what you've learned from that, and start afresh. Absolutely. So, Tannis, I am so sorry we are out of time. I understand that. It's, <laughs> it's been just, fun. <laughs> it has been a blast. So I just have one last thing to say to you. You are a VIP. Well, thank you so much. And that's a wrap for today. Join us next week here on the We Are VIP podcast. We'd love to know how we can help you be a VIP. To find out more, log on to wearevip.com.